2018 is the year of the bird, and you can celebrate with the National Eagle Center during the 25th annual Soar with the Eagles Festival in Wabasha. Each weekend, you can meet exotic birds and catch an impressive lineup of flying bird shows. Plus, enjoy special exhibits, kids' crafts and activities, wild eagle viewing on the Mississippi River, and more. There are thrills for everyone, so don't miss out. Head to Wabasha and soar with the eagles. Today we're here at Whitewater State Park where we're going to learn the process of making maple syrup. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Can you tell us a little bit about Whitewater State Park? So Whitewater State Park's a little under 3,000 acres. Uh, we're located here in Winona County. Um, park was established in 1919, so we're coming on our 100th anniversary next year, which is a big deal. Um, it's a really popular park. It's one of the most popular state parks in the Minnesota state park system, so that's kind of a neat thing. Part of that is location. We're really close to uh, Rochester, Winona, La Crosse. Uh, the Twin Cities like an hour and a half away, so we get visitors from all over. Um, and it's just a really scenic, beautiful park. There's a lot packed into the 3,000 acres here, so families can come out and, and with a half hour hike, see a lot of beautiful landscapes. Um, so excellent hiking trails. We get Boy Scouts coming to hike. They train for Philmont, which is a scout camp down in New Mexico where they do backpacking. So scouts will come and train here. Um, people that are training for marathons, like the Tough Mudder, come and train here. So really, interesting trails where you get a good workout um, and then just beautiful overlooks. Um, we have a swimming beach which is rare in southeast Minnesota. There's no natural lakes so we have a man-made uh, pond here where there's a swimming beach so that attracts a lot of visitors as well. Um, picnic areas, excellent trout fishing, naturalist programs that are offered almost every weekend. So um, just a lot to see and do in this little park. Today we're here to talk about maple syrup and tapping the trees. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, maple syrup making is a really exciting time of the year because it means it's springtime. Um, so we do maple syrup making the first four Saturdays in March every year. Um, we need those temperatures, freezing and thawing temperatures, freezing at night, thawing in the daytime. And um, it's, it's a family-focused program, so we try to teach families uh, the, the supplies they can use in their own homes. They don't have to go out and buy a whole lot to do this in their backyard. So we cover how to tap a maple tree, um, the basic supplies you need, how to cook that sap down, finish it off, and turn it into syrup. So we get a lot of families that come out to the program, and then they go home and make it, and they call us, and they say, hey, we made our own syrup, and they're really excited. So it's fun to see that. You say it's easy, and you can do it in your own backyard, but how does one identify what a maple tree is? So that's important to know. And actually, so what's really interesting is you can tap any type of deciduous tree. So you can tap walnuts, you can tap cherries, you can tap birch trees. It's just they have a different sugar concentration and their sap doesn't flow the same, it doesn't flow as, as fast and as, um, as heavy, I guess you'd say, as a maple tree. And it has a different taste to it. So maple trees are ideal for making syrup. So yeah, we wanna identify maple trees. And so we go over that with the groups today. We'll look at leaves, which is hard this time of year. So we'll look for if there's any leaves in the trees still and on the ground around the tree. We'll look at the bark. They have a special bark that's kind of a gray, I'd say a flaky kind of bark. So we look at the bark, we look at the size of the tree. A maple tree has to be at least 40 years old before you can tap it, um, or at least 12 inches in diameter, so 12 inches across. So usually they're pretty tall by that stage. So we're looking at, not at a shrub, but something that's pretty big. Um, then we also look at the branching, which is the best indicator. Um, maple trees have opposite branching, just like we do. So if I'm a tree and this is my trunk, my arms are opposite one another on the trunk. So the maple tree looks just like a human, actually, when it's branched out naturally. It, uh, the Ojibwe people call them the tree of the human being, actually. So branching is the one really good way to key down a maple tree. And there's three common trees in Minnesota that are opposite branching, maple, ash, and dogwood. So if you find a tree that looks like that, you can narrow it down to one of those three. And then we look at the bark, the height, the, the leaves, and we really say, okay, this is for sure a maple tree. So that's important. We teach people how to look in their own yard. And they can tap um, any type of maple. So silver maple, um, soft maple, hard maple, black maples like we tap, box elders are a type of maple. You can tap any type of maple tree. So people are always amazed, like, box elders? I thought they were just a weed. Um, so that's kind of neat for people to go home then and look in their yards and say, hey, I've got box elders. I'm going to give it a try. So now I know what the tree looks like. What tools do I need to go out and get the sap? 
So if you're gonna do this at home, you need some kind of a drill. So like I said, we use a, a hand brace like the Amish still use today, um, but a power drill works fine. And you can make your own taps, which are really easy to do out of, like I said, a dowel rod, um, but you can buy them. We sell them at our program. You'll see today we sell them for a dollar a piece. So depending on the kind of uh, tool you use for your, your spigot or your, we, we call it a spile. Um, some people use hosing or tubing. People are creative. They come up with all kinds of things as long as it's clean. You know, I always say, think about what the Native American Indians were using. They couldn't go buy the plastic spiles we use today. They had to be creative. So there's, I've seen people make them out of clay, out of pottery and, and things like that. Um, so you need something to stick into that hole. Um, and then some kind of a collection bucket. So you, I've seen people use milk jugs, coffee cans. We use the five gallon pails because we don't get out every day to check our taps. Sometimes it's like three days. So um, we want something that can hold some sap. Um, some people use these plastic bags that look like IV bags from a hospital um, with like tubing that comes down. Um, so there's a variety of things you can use for collecting. And then when it comes time, well, then you'll have to store it. So depending on how much you get, if you can fit it in the fridge, great. We have so much sap that we store it in the buckets with lids on in a dark shed so that stays nice and cool so stuff doesn't mold. Um, and then we have a big pan to cook it in. At home, a lot of times people are cooking it in like maybe soup soup pots, but you want to do the initial boiling outside and you just keep adding sap and boiling it down, you're going to get a ton of steam and it can wreck your house. The steam can warp your woodwork. It can make wallpaper fall off the walls. So you really want to boil it, you know, the big boil outside. Um, and we really recommend people use wood when they're doing that because it's a renewable resource. Um, if you're using LP and gas and stuff like that, that's, you know, not so good for the environment. So we do wood fire um, and then we finish it off on the stove in a soup pan and we do strain it through uh, like a handheld strainer thing, and then we would strain it through cheesecloth a couple times too to get you know all the little particles out of it. Um, and then bottling, which you can put it in ball jars too if you want, like canning jars. Or there's maple syrup supply companies. If you just Google online, that's where we order our jars and our, our taps and things like that that we sell. So yeah, it's pretty easy. You don't need a whole lot of stuff. Most things I think you could find around the house. So spigots come in multiple variety of materials from plastic or even wood, and you just hollow out a little hole in it so that it can drip through. And then to collect all the sap from the tree, you can get a five gallon bucket, a milk jug, or even this used coffee jug and drill a little hole in so that it just drips right into the bucket. How can I tell if a tree is mature enough to tap? They want the tree to be big enough that you're not going to kill it or harm it or stress it by taking too much of its sap. So once it gets to 12 diameters, and that typically takes about 40 years to get that size, then it's okay to put one tap in and you're not going to hurt the tree. Then there's a formula because, uh, was it 12 to 20? I think you can do two taps, 20 to 24. You can do three. If it's over 23, you can do four tra taps. You never do more than four taps in a tree, even if it's a monster tree. And so if you follow that formula and you're you know, conservative with tapping the tree, you can do this for years. There's trees in the New England area that have been tapped for over 200 years and they're still being tapped today. So that's pretty amazing. I mean, these trees heal over if, you, if you're gentle with them, they heal over just like we get a little scar, they get a little scar tissue, but you can keep tapping year after year, so. How was the process discovered to make maple syrup? It goes way back thousands of years ago, and there's kind of a folklore myth associated around how maple syrup was discovered, but it goes back to the Iroquois people who lived in the northeastern part of what we call the United States today. So this, like I said, probably several thousands of years ago. And the story is, um, in this village, um, there was a chief of the village, Chief Waxis. He had been out working in the forest, and this is primitive time, so he's got some kind of a primitive tool he had been using in the forest. And he came back to the village, he threw his, his hatchet into the tree, went in, uh, had supper, went to bed. Um, and so that night it got cold. It's this time of year where temperatures freeze at night, so everything got icy cold again. The puddles froze up, you know, icicles formed. Next morning, Chief Waxis gets up, pulls his hatchet out of the tree, goes back into the forest to do work, and temperatures warm up that day. So the puddles melt, the icicles melt, you know, things are thawing out. And Chief Waxis's wife had set some clay pots up next to the tree to get him out of the way as she was working around the village site. And supposedly the story is the temperatures as they thawed caused the sap to start dripping out of the hole where the hatchet had been. And the sap just so happened to be collecting in those clay pots. So that evening as his wife is preparing supper, she would go down typically to the river with the clay pots to get some water. And she sees her pots are already full of water and she sees the water coming out of the tree. And I mean, it looks just like water, it looks clear. So she's like, hmm, you know, I think I could save myself some time here if I just use this water. So she tastes it and yeah, it's pretty good. It tastes like water with a little bit of a sweet taste. So she decides to cook with this water, add some meat, add some vegetables and herbs. 
and as it's boiling, it's getting really sweet smelling, it's getting thick and gooey, and as Chief Waxus comes back that evening, he's can, he can smell this really delicious smell, and she serves him dinner, and he takes a bite, and he says, this is incredible, you know, what'd you do differently? And she just explained and just used the water coming out of the tree. So supposedly it was a situation like that. It was accidental, um, but they, they discovered that if they kept cooking that gooey stuff down, it turned into sugar. And that's really what the first people were using was the sugar because this is before Tupperware and glass and you know, it was hard to carry liquid around. So they could roll that sugar up in birch bark and leather pouches, um, use it all year round. You know, the way we use salt and pepper or ketchup, they would put maple sugar on their food. Uh, maple sugar was like, it had like a monetary value. They would trade with it. Um, in the early days of this country um, with like Thomas Jefferson, there was a big push to have uh, maple plantations so that we would grow our own sugar because we were trading with uh, the sugar cane and it was all slave grown sugar cane. And so people were really against that and they wanted to try to promote um, growing our own maple trees, our maple orchards and plantations and creating our own maple sugar. The only problem is, you know, it takes 40 years <laughs> to grow one of those trees. And then if something happens like fire or whatever, you know, you got to replant, it takes another 40 years. It wasn't practical. It really wasn't a practical, but that was a big push because they really didn't want to be reliant on slave grown cane sugar. So maple sugar has a really, really old kind of history in this country and before this was even a country here in North America, I guess you'd say. Um, and it's, it's traded all around the world today because they can't make it in other countries. So it's a pretty special, special product that we're spoiled, you know, we grow up with it and don't think twice about it. But if you live in China or across the ocean, it's a big deal to have maple syrup. So here we have a grading sample of the different types of syrup you can get. It goes from the Vermont Fancy to Grade B. And the Grade B, they say, is the, one of the best and purest that you can get. As a matter of fact, in some places, in some parts of the world, you can pay over $100 for just one gallon of this grade. So as you can see, tapping this here tree was pretty easy. It only took me about a minute, and even you guys can do it in your backyard. So if you'd like more information or have any questions at all, contact Sarah at Whitewater Park here in St. Charles. 2018 is the year of the bird, and you can celebrate with the National Eagle Center during the 25th annual Soar with the Eagles Festival in Wabasha. Each weekend, you can meet exotic birds and catch an impressive lineup of flying bird shows. Plus, enjoy special exhibits, kids' crafts and activities, wild eagle viewing on the Mississippi River, and more. There are thrills for everyone, so don't miss out. Head to Wabasha and soar with the eagles. At Midtown Foods, we know it's not just about getting groceries. It's about friendly faces fresh produce, quality cuts of meat, and experienced employees. We know because we shop here too. Midtown Foods, Winona's largest locally owned grocery store, downtown Winona. Okay, you just need to choose a protection plan here that works best for you and you'll be driving away in your new car. We want to make sure that you and your family feel protected against any issues that may arise. I think the platinum option works best for you. Did you notice how Max Profit didn't give you the option to say no? You don't need this pressure. It doesn't have to be this way. Max Profit doesn't work at Lewiston Auto, so you won't be pressured to pay for what you don't need. Visit lewistonauto.com to learn more. Lewiston Auto, the value leader. Today I made the short 30 minute drive from Monona to Wabasha, Minnesota to the National Eagle Center so that I can meet some wild eagles up close, but also I can look at them outside their windows. We currently have five eagle ambassadors. We have 
four bald eagle ambassadors and one golden eagle ambassador. And bald and golden eagles are the only species of eagle found in North America. The bald eagle is unique in that it is only found in North America. And the golden eagle, which is found in the western half of the United States, um, is found around the northern hemisphere around the globe. What's the difference between a bald eagle and a golden eagle? Uh, well, lots of differences. They're, they're completely different species. Um, a bald eagle is going to have a habitat that is more near water. They're, they're part of what we call the sea eagle or water eagle family. Um, they're going to eat a variety of things, but the staple of their diet is going to be fish. So that's why people often take videos or have photos of bald eagles snatching those fish right out of the water. Whereas uh, golden eagles are not going to be found near water typically. Um, you're going to find them out in the mountain west or desert southwest of the United States. Um, they're not going to be eating fish usually. They're going to be eating smaller birds, uh, small mammals, things of that nature. Um, out in the mountain west, there's certainly documented cases of them waiting until mountain goats get on a, a mountain ledge. They'll dive down and kind of pull it off and let gravity do the rest of the work and then they'll feed on them on the ground. Um, when golden eagles are here in this part of the country in the winter months, uh, one of their favorite things to hunt and eat are wild turkeys. So they take down some pretty big prey items out there. How strong is an eagle? With bald eagles, because their eyes and their, their vision is so important to their survival, uh, they only use their beak to really eat. That's not a weapon, uh, that's not something they're going to fight with, so they want to protect their eyes. Their talons, uh, they have a crushing power of up to 400 pounds per square inch on those talons. So they're very capable of you know, catching a fish and they're not gonna let go of that fish. That's why they're able to pull it out of the water so successfully. Um, you know, if they catch something like a rabbit or a squirrel, they're going to be able to basically crush that animal to death when they, when they catch it. Um, so when our handlers, our avian care handlers and our trainers are working with the birds, you'll always see them wearing very thick leather gauntlets on their hands. Um, and that's simply a protective measure against those talons. Um, now, truth be told, if one of those eagles for some reason decided to really you know, clamp down with their, their talons, they would still crush the handler's arm. That probably isn't going to happen simply because the way the training is done. You know, our trainers, when they work with a bird, um, it's a very long process. It's a process that is going to build trust with that bird. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. So by the time that you are to a point where the eagle is comfortable sitting on your arm, um, there really is a strong relationship there. But the eagles themselves actually are not all that big. We see those birds, especially out in nature, or if you visit the National Eagle Center here, you can get within four or five feet of the birds, and they look very, very large. But it's mostly feather. Um, truth be told, they're not that large. Um, Angel and Columbia are two large females here at this facility. Um, they weigh about 10, 10 and a half pounds each. When a visitor comes in here, they always say, oh, those, those eagles are so large. They look very large. The common guess that people say, like, how much do you think that bird weighs? They'll say, oh, 20 pounds, 30 pounds. That's the typical guess because people see that. And those birds, just to look at them, you know, I think people equate that to, oh, that was the size of you know, the turkey we had for Thanksgiving. So they think 20 to 30 pounds, when in truth, they're only about 10, 10 and a half pounds. Here at the National Eagle Center, there's always something new to learn. And if you want to see eagles up close and personal, here is the place to be. It's a unique experience to come here. Um, the bald eagle, um, especially the bald eagle, you know, it's our national symbol. Um, it has a special meaning for people, but that meaning is different for different people. For example, um, there was a time not so long ago in the United States where the bald eagle was a critically endangered species. Um, you know, you look back to the late 60s through the 70s into the 80s, um, for a lot of people that were um, you know, growing up or working or traveling during those years, seeing a bald eagle was a big deal. Now, for a lot of people, if you saw a bald eagle in the wild, that may be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, so we see a lot of um, older adults that come here now and they see the birds. And you know, for them, 30 years ago, that was an unthinkable reality, you know, to be able to see one in the wild, let alone 
see a live bald eagle you know, just a few feet away from you. So that's special for them. Um, for kids, you know, kids are, are often naturally curious. They, they like animals, they like learning about nature, the natural world. Um, so for school groups, which we have plenty of them throughout the year that come here, um, it's just a very cool experience for them to see, you know, this live bird, this live animal. Um, depending on the age of the school kids, you know, they walk into the space where the eagles are on display. Those eagles may seem like they're bigger than they are, which is also um, cool for them. But um, so many kids just have a natural affinity and connection for, for wild animals and, and bald eagles especially. We see that every single day. Um, another group that certainly has a special connection to bald eagles in our country are veterans. Um, anyone who has served the United States, um, we, we see it when they come here. They just they have a special connection to a bald eagle um, that I think your, your general visitor just doesn't have or doesn't share. There's a greater appreciation there. Um, and so there's this reverence that we see from veterans. And that's why, um, you know, Part of our outreach program throughout the year is that we take our Eagle Ambassadors up to the VA hospital up in, in the Twin Cities. And we, we visit veterans who have been injured, who are recovering. Um, we take the birds to them because it's the living symbol of this country for which they have served. And so there is that very special connection for them um, to meet that living symbol. Um, and I guess I would say the final group that comes to mind very, very quickly are Native Americans. Um, certainly the bald eagle um, has a significance to Native American culture that um, you know, I, I don't think I fully appreciate. I don't fully understand the connection, but um, the amount of reverence they have for them, um, the role that the bald eagle plays in, in their religious ceremonies and their spirituality, um, is so significant and you know where we are today in Wabasha that was the summer camp uh, for the, the native Dakota people and so we are right here in the you know the center of what was kind of a spiritual home for that community um, for that nation and so for them to come here and to see the bald eagles being taken care of um, I, I know that's important to them um, the Prairie Island Indian community up in Red Wing, um, they're great supporters of the National Eagle Center. Um, they have certainly supported us in the past. They continue to, to advocate and support us now. And um, we, we certainly appreciate and understand um, how significant the bald eagle is to them. How did you get these eagles? And especially Latch, because that's your newest ambassador yep. from Winona. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the eagles that we have here, the eagle ambassadors come from all over the country. Um, like I said, Angel and Columbia are both from northern Wisconsin originally. Um, they had uh, various injuries. They were treated, went to the Raptor Center, and were deemed unreleasable due to the nature of their injuries. Um, when any facility like the Raptor Center, and there, there are multiple facilities like that around the country, when they get birds that are rescued, they go through the rehab and they say, okay, well, you know, this wing isn't going to ever heal properly or, or fully that the bird will be able to survive. At that point, they have to make a choice. I mean, depending on the severity of an injury, you, it may just be more humane to euthanize a bird. But if a bird, you know, can still live a, a fairly, you know, normal life, just they can't fly for whatever reason, um, they can find a permanent home for those birds. Um, here at the National Eagle Center, we have, well, both of our males, um, Latch and Wishaka both have eye problems. They're both blind in their left eye. Um, so in the case of Latch, uh, that would have been one of the factors is that our staff here, our, our caretakers, our educational team and avian care team, they have experience working with an eagle that has an eye issue. In the case of Wishaka, he actually needs daily eye drops in his left eye. Um, and of course, there's training around that, both for the handler and for the bird. You know, you have to train the bird to be comfortable with you having an eyedropper right next to its head. You have to, um, and, and basically what that is, is through positive reinforcement. So, you know, every time that Washaka 
gets his eye drop successfully, we're going to give him a little a food bit so that he associates getting his eye drop with something positive. That's how we train our birds. Um, the first eagle ambassador that we had here, very well known um, in Minnesota and around the country, was Harriet. Um, she had a partially amputated wing. Um, she was um, a bird that was very well suited to being an education bird and working with the public. Um, everyone that has worked with her, every visitor that ever met or visited Harriet would attest to the fact that she, her demeanor um, was, was atypical for a bald eagle. She was very calm um, and just a very, very good ambassador. Just there, there really wasn't a lot out there that would make her nervous and so she was very good in the classroom setting and working with veterans or school children, things like that. Even if you've been to the National Eagle Center before, many times before, um, each experience is, is totally different. Um, example, I just interacted with a couple from the Twin Cities. They were here yesterday. And they came here and there were eagles literally flying right outside the building. Um, they saw eagles right outside the building catching fish, flying them up to the trees, and they were just in awe. They were, they were, <laughs> couldn't get enough of the scopes. They were looking out the scopes out the window and they were just, they were having the best time. And, and as I was talking with them and kind of answering their questions, I said, well, have you, is this your first time to the National Eagle Center? And they said, no. And I said, What's happening right now is so important because people always want to know, you know, are you seeing eagles right now? Are eagles moving right now? Is migration happening right now? And because you're dealing with nature, you can never be sure. You're like, you might come here on a beautiful day like today um, and you might see tons of eagles outside. Sometimes you might come here, you might not see as many, but with all things nature, you have to just keep going out and experiencing it. Um, and even with the programs that we do here, the classroom program, we have you know six, seven different presenters who do the classroom program. And even though you've come and seen the program before, if you come and see it with a different presenter, you're going to learn something new. Each one of those presenters, they have a different focus that they want to share about the eagle world with people. You know, some people might um, talk more about golden eagles than bald eagles. Some people might talk more about the cultural significance of bald eagles. Um, some of them might spend more time on the life cycle of the bald eagle. Um, but I can tell you, having seen probably six or seven different presenters do their programs, each one is different, and you're always going to learn something new. So 2018 is the year of the bird, and you can celebrate with the National Eagle Center during the 25th annual Soar with the Eagles Festival in Wabasha. Each weekend, you can meet exotic birds and catch an impressive lineup of flying bird shows. Plus, enjoy special exhibits, kids' crafts and activities, wild eagle viewing on the Mississippi River, and more. There are thrills for everyone, so don't miss out. Head to Wabasha and soar with the eagles. Sunshine Refuse is your locally owned and operated choice for trash removal in the Winona and surrounding communities. Owner Tony Buckland built Sunshine Refuse on service and he and his crew put the needs of their customers first, as your satisfaction is their number one priority and you can see it in their work. Put a little sunshine in your day. Call Sunshine Refuse at 507-452-5107 and start your service today. You'll be happy that you did.